Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's great. It's great to be in uh, New York. My name is Chandar. Um, and I'm the opening act to a fantastic panel today, Deep Thoughts on Channeling Humanity with some great speakers. So I'll spend just five minutes giving context on our perspectives on hum channeling humanity. Um, this is a show of hands. How many of us have heard of Mercado? OK, great. Um, I'm not going to talk about Mercado. We have a booth outside. Uh, we are a leading digital marketing platform in a category called marketing automation. But I just wanted to talk about the concept of engagement first. How many of us have heard of a gentleman named Michael Pollan? OK, there's a few of us here. And those of us who haven't, um, he's a UC Berkeley professor. He's uh, you know, a deep thinker in the area of the food industry. He's done a lot of research and very passionate about it. And he took all the spend in the food industry. There's billions and billions of dollars being spent on the different diets, on the different weight reduction plans, et cetera. And he boiled the food industry into seven words. And he said his advice in the food industry was, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I'm doing very good on the first 33% of his advice. I do better on the, on the other 66%. So I thought I'll channel my inner Michael Pollan today and give you the seven words, all the craziness that is happening in marketing today, and give you the seven words in my perspective, my inner Michael Pollan. And that would be build long-term humanized, personalized relationships with your customers. If you forget anything else I said today, uh, that would be my seven words. The question is, why does this matter today on building long-term relationships with customers? Um, because we live in a world where the power has shifted from the seller to the buyer. If you look at the research and the data, 60 to 66 to 90 percent of a buyer's journey is self-directed, even before any brand knows that they are engaging with them. How many of us have bought a car in the last three years? Okay, there's many of us here, and we know that when we bought the car in the last three years, we probably showed up to the dealership in the last step of our journey, when we did all the research and we self-directed, rather than the, when I bought the car in 1992, my first car, I showed up in the first step of my journey where the seller had all the power. So take that same thing, and whether you're buying turbo engines from GE or software from Mercado or cars from Tesla, your self-directing journeys and brands are, have to adapt to the buyer-driven world, which means it's a great news for us marketers because sales cannot be the function that becomes the steward of that customer experience. It's marketing, and we have a unique power today to be that steward and be the architect of that customer experience, as evidenced by a new report that's coming out by The Economist in a few weeks. And just to give you an early plug for that, um, The Economist and e Economist Intelligence Unit in Marketo, uh, we surveyed about 500 CMOs throughout the world, and 86% of them said that they will own the customer experience, be that architect, that steward of the customer experience by 2020. Now, to do that, that's great on one hand. The other hand, we have to shift our paradigm of how we are operated in marketing. And this is where, very quickly, we have to go from a world where we have talked at people, mass marketing, where we have talked at people, one message to everybody. And being in New York, we know that the goal of mass marketing is, how do I be louder? How do I be more clever? How do I tap into your emotion of make you laugh, make you smile? And trying to talk generically to all people and it's tough to stay above the noise today when we're getting 3,000 messages blasted to us every day. And this is what happens, that a lot of brands are talking and a lot of us are closing our ears. To go shift from that into a world of what we call building relationships, and the term we use is engagement marketing, which is it's not about the transaction, getting someone to buy through one message. It's about building deep, personalized relationships over time by talking to each person in a way that's relevant and contextual to them. And the idea is nothing new, except that you have technology at scale to build relationships through intimacy and trust, as in this couple. You know, how many of us are married? How many of us got married the first, after the first date? Only in India, the hands go up when I actually ask this, <laughs> right? Um, but having said that, the, the, the point is, it's about trust, intimacy over time, and using technology that brings advertising and marketing together to do it at scale. So simply put, business today is not about B to B or B to C. It's about B to H, business to human, and how can we channelize, channel humanity into our conversations with customers to build long-term relationships. So that's my point of view. And without further ado, I want to turn it back to Matthew and the esteemed, audience, esteemed speakers he has today to further double click on this topic. Thank you, folks. Thank you.
Uh, we're discussing channeling humanity, and to do that, I have immediately to my left uh, Rishi Dave, who is Chief Marketing Officer at Dun & Bradstreet. Um, next to him is uh, Jeff Wright, Vice President of Customer Engagement at Autodesk, and at the far end, um, Ryan Ross, who is Executive Vice President Marketing and Digital Commerce at HSN, which I guess used to be known as Home Shopping Network, and Correct. we now call HSN. Um, and we were backstage talking about what the hell does this topic mean, um, <laughs> channeling humanity. We've got some guidance from Chan, there's an inter interesting set of slides, but it seems to be something about personalization, about engagement and relationship building, and maybe also the, the, the phrase humanity implies, I guess, maybe a sort of sense of purpose and meaning as well in the whole thing. So I wanted to start with you, um, Rishi, I mean, you have sure. this, I've been enjoying your, your website, Chief Madness Officer, um, the, <laughs> the true meaning of the M in CMO. Uh, so you've got a bit of humanity, a bit of humor yes. in there. Now, tell, tell us a bit about what, what does this topic mean to you? Yes. You didn't tell the whole story. So what the three of us met before this session, and we said, do you know who our moderator is? And then Matt was right in front of us. He's like, oh, that's me. And then he turns to us. He's like, hey, guys, do you know what this topic is about? <laughs> <laughs> so we're always on top of the job here. At the <laughs> um, so in terms of what channeling humanity means to me, it's, you know, when I look at what ultimately the CMO or marketers have to do, you know, like Chandra said, it's very simple. You know, use data and analytics to prioritize the right set of customers to go after, and then just you know, create great experiences for them, um, micro experiences, which you can now do with technology. And so the humanity piece is the second piece. So the, uh, the left brain piece is all the data and analytics and modeling that you use and you embed in your technology to decide, you know, who's even, who you should go after, who you can help. Um, and then, but that's only half of it, right? Um, even if you know who those people are, and this is where most companies fall apart nowadays. What do you actually say to them? What kind of experience do you actually give them so that they want to build a relationship with you? Um, that's the humanity piece. You need both sides of the coin um, to be successful. And when I think about the humanity piece, you know, there's been a lot in marketing about like, oh, it's about like, you know, emotion and touchy-feely and they have to love you and make them laugh and cry and all that. And um, you know, I've tried everything in digital and you know, I'm not producing a movie. Like what I find is that what really gets customers connected to you is when you are able to challenge them and tell them how they can be more successful. Um, that's where they really get connected to you and that's where they really stay connected to you versus anything else. Give us some examples. So a, a great example is um, we target, we work with a lot of uh, marketers. We sell to a lot of marketers. And so, um, a lot of times you see a lot of content. All of you are marketers, you hear a lot of content on the web about all kinds of topics. Um, when we kind of identify a customer leveraging our analytics who we think's a great candidate for what we do, um, we provide them content that's very specific to the challenges we know they're facing because we work with five other customers like them based on our analytics. And so we ask them the question, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about this? A lot of times they're not. But that opens up the conversation to help them think differently about how they look at data analytics to drive their job. And we know it's relevant for them because we've done it for five other customers like them based on our modeling. Then you can have a very human conversation. And that's where you channel humanity saying, OK, we know who you are. We know what you're facing. And here's our perspective, our unique perspective on how you can grow. Um, and then we create those experiences based on those uh, versus anything else. And, and what I find is it's that content that resonates with them, that challenges them, and helps them do their day-to-day -day life more than any kind of fancy, emotional, cool kind of infographic or whatever. It's really that content and having that unique perspective. So Jeff, what, what does it mean for, for you at Autodesk? Autodesk is going through a, a massive change right now as a, as a company. So for those of you who don't know what Autodesk does, we, we make software for the world's architects, engineers, designers of most of the things you see around you. And 
for forever we have sold made and sold software as you know, box software. You sell a licensed box software, and our whole business was built around that as a uh, um, you know as a way of engaging the customer. It was you know, incentives really focused on driving the sale, and then you move on to the next one. And marketing's job was to feed acquisition leads to our salespeople, and that was how the engine was really tuned. We are now becoming a subscription business, right? delivering software through the cloud. And this, it sounds like a simple change. It is a monumental shift in the way that we have to do business, but also the way that we engage with our customers. So the incentives in our business are shifting in a very positive way. It, it, the business model shift is aligning our interests with that of the customer, which is forcing marketing to say, hey, it's not just about driving new acquisition of customers, it's about helping the customer Just to unpa unpack that a bit more, that it's aligning them. I mean, how were your interests aligned before? Not, not so well. Well, you know, but yeah, again, what, I think, what you know, you, What's changed in that relationship? Right, you know, think about how marketers measure themselves traditionally. It's, you know, how, how many conversions of, of X, right? You know, did, did, we, did we get that person to um, respond to our communication and then ultimately buy? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, you, it is a joint measure of success if the customer found your product useful. Um, but if that's where the engagement ends, right, uh, you know, it, it, um, it doesn't necessarily help the customer achieve success. So for us, in order to survive as a subscription business, we have to ensure that our customers are successful with our solutions. and. Because it's moved from them. being a one-off every few exactly. years to it's being a It's a long-term relationship that we have to build. And so it, it fundamentally changes our whole approach to marketing. So any, any things that you've done differently now in terms of? Yeah, absolutely. As, as Rishi was saying, one of the things that we are now doing is our, making our marketing valuable to the customer. Right? So we actually think of our marketing as a product now, right? the same way that our software is a product. It's got to have inherent value to the, the audience that we're delivering it to. And if it doesn't, then you know, we either we're, we're, um, our, we have a different objective from the customer or we're not doing a good job connecting. And so we, that's how we're starting to measure ourselves. And, and um, it's, a, it's a hard change, but it's an important one. That's a great characterization, marketing as a product. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, Ryan, well, do, do, you, do you find that a familiar idea? Yes, I'm just kind of going back to the whole humanity aspect. I mean, for those of you, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Home Shopping Network or HSN. Um, and for, you, for those of you that do not, um, you know, we're a 39 year old company and we really started um, with developing the whole sense of humanity and developing that connection with the customer. Um, that's really our sole basis of our model is really connecting with her. We know who she is. Um, it really starts with understanding your customer, understanding what she looks like, feels like, acts like, what's important to her, what are those things that she's going to respond to. So taking humanity down to the basic level is connection. So what we do is we really provide a connection with what we do, with what, she, what we know she wants. Um, she loves to shop. We provide her that experience. She likes, to be, she likes to learn more. She likes to be educated. She likes to hear stories. She likes to be entertained. We do all of those things. We're, we're constantly creating that connection. So really for us, channeling humanity is how do we do that across all the different platforms that we have? So whether it be on the television network, be on digital, be on our app, be on mobile, how are we as a company telling that continuous story of connectivity to really provide that sense of humanity so that she feels like she's having a one-to-one -one co um, conversation with us? Which of course leads to personalization, and I know that's probably where, we, where we'll be headed next, so I'll just take us there. Um, the idea around personalization and what does that look like and how does the company, how do we leverage personalization? Um, it's been a massive initiative. It's been a very large investment um, for the company. Um, we started about two, two and a half years ago on the initiative and really starting to understand the customer. It's no longer does she fit into this segment or that segment and you bulk, you bulk all these people together. It's really about developing more of individualized communication um, based on what we know about her. So it can either be on behavior that she's exhibited in the past, it's real-time behavior that we're seeing real-time and we're executing accordingly, depending upon what channel she's choosing to engage with, 
We do it across digital. We do it across our customer service center. Um, there's a lot of activities that we're doing right now to really try and provide, again, that personal connection. And again, that's truly the definition of humanity. Well, let's stick with, with that. And, and you know, I, I guess traditionally until you went multi-channel and so forth, you were, your model was uh, typically people would have your channel on as ambient background yep. and they would be keeping half an eye on it, a bit like other people who are into share trading would have CNBC on and, and, and every now and again they'd see something that interests them and then they would yes. zero in on it. Um, and as you say, you knew your customer pretty well, mm -hmm. but now you have a, the opportunity to go that much deeper and get to the personal level. I mean, do you, what, what, are, the, what are the key things that are gonna change or are changing in terms of, you know, I guess that people may not even be at home when they're doing their shopping using your your network anymore are they are they going to be uh, can you rely on them browsing in the way that you used to be able to do or do you have is it changing uh, definitely i mean th i mean the biggest thing that's changing across all of our businesses is customers don't have time they have limited time plus they have optimum choice i mean there's so many more choices out there of where you choose to shop um, there's very few people that just shop in one place obviously um, so the choice is bigger um, what our advantage is, is again, that connection in the storytelling. We provide it in a different way than other people do. Um, and not only do we have the live presentation, but we have nine studios that are running uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 364. Um, we let everyone off for Christmas. Um, we are nice that way. Um, but you know, when there's not live presentations going, we also are uh, continuously creating original content, so continue that story. So. Um, Many of our items, almost all of our items, we've got 75,000 um, items online, they all have a story attached to them. They have some sort of content attached to them so that we're always continuing that dialogue. And I would say what's changed again is not having that time and how can we provide that information and that content faster and more readily available, whether it be through um, our app or through our mobile distribution. So. And what sort of things are you finding work in terms of making sure that when people do see your content that they want to spend time with. What's working is getting them um, to where they want to go fast. So getting them to the product level and then providing the content when they want it versus trying to put it in between the interaction. It's very important to, pl to place the mar a little bit of marketing elements up front, let her get to the product, and then provide additional reinforcement once she's there. So that's really how we've changed our kind of shopping pattern and shopping experience. Um, I, mean, I guess my, my experience still of uh, generally, in looking at ads that are put on Facebook and other platforms when I'm consuming using either you know, the, the desktop or the, or the mobile phone, it's still that they don't really understand me very well. It's not very personalized. Um, there'll be some particular transactions that I might have uh, been, might have done that seem to heavily dominate all the ads I get for months afterwards and so forth. It depends but, on who has the biggest marketing budget. Yeah, and so I mean, to, to what extent, and so that actually is, is quite annoying. It's not quite as annoying as pop-up ads used to be, mm -hmm. but it's, it's fairly annoying still. I mean, have we, do you feel you, how far off are we from really getting the degree of personalization that you not only are able to figure out roughly what I'm interested in, but also make sure that I'm not annoyed by your constantly reminding me of it? Um, Jeff, what you yeah, I think it's incredibly difficult to get that right. And um, if any of, any of you out there have really figured it out, please come and see me afterward. It's really hard. And I think it's hard for a variety of reasons. You know, it, some of it has to do with just the, the quality of the data you're able to gather about people and, and then you know, being able to put them, segment them into different meaningful groups and then understand what that means and then create the right content that, that uh, um, cap captures them. Those are all really hard things to do individually, but you have to do all of those really well in order to make personalization work well. You, any one piece of that is not quite right. Personalization doesn't really work very well. And yet it, it, is, it is where we all need to go. We, we know that, as, as Chandra said, the, the, the buyer is now in control, right? They're making the decisions and uh, we have to communicate with them on their terms, and I think that's what's driving us all in this, mm -hmm. in this direction. And you know, doing it at a distance is just hard, right? I mean, we all know that um, as individuals, we can interact with other human beings, and we're just innately good at picking up on people's cues and responding to those in real time. Trying to automate that is hard, and yet 
the technology uh, and the data that enables it is moving forward at a very rapid pace. So I, I think it's a, um, it's a worthwhile endeavor, uh, but it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, I totally agree. <laughs> But what I've seen, and I may be speaking more about the B2B world, is um, more and more um, I'm seeing B2B companies and B2B CMOs being much more focused in who they're going after. So um, in my role, I talk to a lot of B2B CMOs, and they talk a lot about, I need to go after these 100 accounts, or 1,000 accounts, or 3,000, whatever the number is, depending on your scale. But what that allows you to do, and um, you know, we do a lot of analytics ourselves to identify who those are by line of business and incorporating that in our go-to-market motion. But that kind of focus, what it allows you to do is um, really um, control the sheer quantity of data and focus that you have um, on a fewer set of customers, accounts, contacts, and really surround them based on who they are at an almost individual level. And so more and more, what you'll see in B2B companies, at least I can speak to them, is um, you know, they'll, I, many times I'll hear, look, I need to just get into these 1,000 accounts this year. And if I get this much, it's more than enough for me. That helps focus. And you know, that's still a lot. But what I've noticed companies are doing more and more is they're saying, OK, let's take, and this is kind of a lean-like approach, let's take 10 accounts where we see the biggest opportunity and let's figure out how to win with them very quickly, demonstrate success, and then let's scale to the next 30, 100, 200, 2,000. Um, we can do that in today's world, in a digital world, because we can scale very quickly once we know what we're doing. And so I'm seeing that more, especially in the B2B space, than the more I need to target this general type of audience. And so I do a lot of marketing, and I bring a lot of people into my funnel, and then I let my funnel you know, so is, there an example, down. is there a specific example without naming the company that you could talk, yep. so talk I, through how that's different from what would have been the case before? Mm -hmm. So I spoke to um, a very large global telecom company last week. And um, I spoke to the head of marketing. And what they actually did was very interesting. Um, they had two heads of marketing. Uh, one head of marketing was head of marketing for their top 1,500 accounts. Um, and then they had another head of marketing who ran everything else. And, and the, the woman who was in charge of marketing for the top 1,500 accounts, um, the amount of sophistication that she had in terms of how she was going to market and the amount of sophistication that we were working with her on was at a whole different level um, because she was able to be very focused. So let me give you an example on a, on a tactical level. One global customer she's going after, right, which every big telecom company is going after, you know, with proprietary set of analytics on that customer, she understood exactly who to go after in that account, where to go after that person in the world, et cetera, based on her data and third-party data that her competitors didn't have. That focus allowed her to do that. And what was the split between a digital approach and an in-person approach to yeah. it, it, it was a, after that? It was both. Uh, I, don't know what the, I don't know what it was for that particular account, but you know, she was doing a combination of using analytics to figure out the set of accounts to go after, and then within those accounts, who do you go after? And then um, leveraging a combination of both outbound as well as digital and inbound to surround the contacts within that account um, with the message. Jeff, does, do you relate to that? Uh, yeah, I do. I think our, our problem is, um, is a little different. We, we have a, a very long tail of customers. You know, we have m millions of prospects and customers. And, uh, and so the, the higher touch approach works in some cases, but for us, we really have to figure out how to do personalization at, at scale. And, and that's what I think is, is most challenging. So give us one example of where there's real, you know, as you say, productization of the marketing, that you're giving a value proposition. Yeah, sure. Just in the way you market. Well, so for example, we know that some of our tools are not so easy for people to learn how to use. I mean, they're, they're very powerful tools, and there's a learning curve. And, and so we've started to figure out, OK, well, what are the things that are the biggest barriers to success for a, a, a new customer for a particular design tool that we, we make? And um, we test that, make sure that it actually is valuable to the audience that we're trying to reach. 
And then we identify people who meet those criteria and we deliver the content, that specific content to them. It's, it's designed to be helpful as opposed to designed to uh, get them to buy more. Now, these customers are much more likely to stay customers if we can get them successful quickly. They're also more likely to buy more and to tell other people uh, that they should, they should uh, use these tools. So you know, we're finding that that approach um, is, is very helpful, and it's a very different one from the one that we would take uh, previously. Before I come on to, to you, uh, Ryan, just to ask everyone to be thinking of questions to put to the panel, and do please use our app to send in questions as well. Ryan, I mean, how does, how does B2C differ from B2B? I mean, are, are, um, do these same themes apply in both areas? Or? I think the same themes apply. I think that when we talk about personalization, um, one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is just the organizational change and the thought process that, that the organization has to go through when we start to take on personalization. Um, the reliance on data and insights is larger than it ever has been. Um, the reliance on creative and marketing elements is larger than it ever has been. So when you were providing the same experience to everyone and now you're differentiating your experience and you have 800, excuse me, 8 million visitors a week, that's a, that's a lot of creative that you're, that you're suddenly changing. So the way in which the organization is set up and the resources to really fuel personalization is quite expensive. So for it to be appropriate and to see the appropriate return on that investment, you have to do a lot of testing. Because dependent upon your target customer and dependent upon what you're trying to achieve, too much personalization can actually have an adverse effect. Because then you suddenly become the big brother approach and to your point that you're getting ads or you're getting personalization based on a single transaction, if you get too much of that, you suddenly get a little, um, um, it can have a detrimental um, effect on your brand if you're not careful. So there's a lot of testing. You have to figure out what the elasticity and the amount of personalization that your customer wants. When she says that's enough, you stop and you start testing again in a different way and you kind of get her used to it because uh, personalization is relatively new. I mean, it's only been within the last um, a number of years that you actually could figure out your email profile and how often you wanted to be emailed and if you're male or female and what are your interests. So personalization is that times 100. So there's a lot of testing and there's a lot of organizational repercussions if you're not careful. And, so, and, and briefly, I mean, in terms of moving from the traditional you know, television-based mm -hmm. uh, channel, you know, how, how, how typically is your customer reaching you now? Are they through an app or are they through Facebook or? Uh, they're through it? all of those. I mean, our is most- there, our, one, none, none of those is dominant at all? Um, digital, digital for us is about 40, any, it goes between about 45 to 48% of the business. Um, of that, desktop is, the, is half that. Um, mobile is by far our largest growing um, platform of choice. Um, mobile handset is our largest growing, which is not, I'm sure to anyone in this room, is not a surprise. Mobile handset's the biggest. Tablet is, is, is kind of right around there, but our app is growing consistently. Our app really grows with our, with our database and with our customer. Our most loyal customers use the app. Obviously, if you're new to- And people brain, will come to the app on their own volition, or they have to be prompted to come? Uh, they come to the app on their own. Um, they, our customer, our most loyal customers and our kind of elite customers are second screening all day long. So they might have it on and they're on their app and they're purchasing throughout the day. Uh, we have a very large um, two times buyer. So many of our customers buy two, three times a day, not all at once. Um, they don't put it all in their cart and buy it at once. Um, they do it throughout the day. Um, there's, a, there's a big interaction between what's happening on the network versus whether it be the app or uh, mobile. And, and I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to add to that as well. Um, we also have to think not just personalization of the message, um, and I agree doing a lot of testing, but what we find in our SMB business, especially on our small side of SMB, is that you also have to personalize the channels that you use. And I don't think we talk enough about that because we talk always about digital, and I agree digital is the biggest one for us as well. But you know, in our small business segment, for example, there's a lot of businesses that are family-owned businesses, for example, like a retail pizza shop or a retail this, and they're not on the computer all day. right? So many of them, we do micro-segment to a retailer that's family-owned, but digital may not be the best way to get them. And so we have to think about channeling humanity, not just in the content we do, uh, but also in the channels we choose and respect the channel that will be most advantageous for them. Yeah, just to, uh, I'll add a point to that because we, at Autodesk, like a lot of B&B of &B companies, 
We've relied on email as the primary channel of communication with our customers, marketing included, for a long time. W why? Because it's uh, easiest and the cheapest, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> not, not necessarily yeah. in the interest of the person you're trying to communicate That's with. That's exactly right. Right? And, and so we decided that we need to do <coughs> something radical in order to change our own behavior. So we decided, you know what? We're going to stop sending emails to anyone in our pro prospect or customer database unless we've earned the right to be heard by them. And to earn the right, you know, we, we said, okay, there, there are certain things that have to be true in order for us to feel as though we've earned the right. Um, they need to have responded very explicitly to content that we valuable, hopefully, content that we've put out there that they've uh, come across, for, for example, and engage to a level that, that indicates that, yeah, they want more. Now, now we feel like we can, uh, we've been invited into their inbox rather than forcing ourselves in and being among the you know, 400 vendors every morning that they have to delete right, uh, uh, in, in great annoyance. We don't want to be that brand, but it, it's so hard to change these things because you know, it's so easy. It's just so easy for the marketer and the machinery is all built around executing in exactly that way. Are any of you experimenting with uh, Snapchat or WeChat or uh, Periscope or anything like that as a, as a, as a channel to reach? Customers? Not, we, we have not no. experimented. I mean, I guess that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, you, I we would you presume you can reach yeah. a new audience. Yeah, if I have to. Yes, we do Periscope, do Facebook them? Live. Um, again, any of that kind of live in the moment interaction, we, we do take advantage of all that. So, uh, Jeff, there's a question in from, for, for you. Um, love Autodesk's line, shape, space website. Uh, you, you'll tell us what that is. Yeah. How do you measure the business <laughs> ROI of that content marketing? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking the question. L Lime Shape Space is a, uh, a blog. It's a blog that um, is a thought leadership blog pr primarily that we put out. It's a, a, a small team in my organization that's responsible for it. And it, um, it's, a, it's a really good example of making marketing a product, right? So if you go and look at it, you'll, you'll see that the articles that are written there are very much targeted at our target customer, right, or the, the variety of target customers that we have, but there's no selling going on. We don't sell anything. And in fact, Autodesk's brand itself, the name Autodesk is, is pretty subordinate in that whole experience. Um, and yet, you know, at least someone out here recognized that that is an Autodesk <laughs> um, uh, communication vehicle. So how do we measure the ROI of that? It, it's hard, right? I mean, and, and, and marketers, I think, have faced this challenge um, for, forever. How do you prove that my marketing actually drove revenue? And I think, you know, the, 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 uh, the closed loop, as it were, is getting better, but it's still not perfect. So for us to, you know, can I prove that um, readers of Line Shape Space bought more than those that didn't? Not very easily. So I don't really try to prove that right now. What, I, what we focus on is ensuring that, um, that the people for whom we're creating that content are getting a ton of value out of it. And we're pretty highly confident that, that uh, and we know a bit about the audience. You know, we actually can go and, and, and understand who they are and, and you know, do sort of qualitative research among them. And you know, if, if we know that we are engaging with that target audience well based on the feedback and the engagement metrics we get, then that's ROI for us for, for a, a publication like Line Shape Space. So we got any questions from the audience? Oh, we're shy today. Um, over anyone at the back? Yes, great. You, you win the free Economist notebook. Um. <laughs> So let, let's take this back to humanity. Um, I just say who you are as well. Oh, I'm Jay Mandel from MasterCard. Mm -hmm. So how is all this channeling humanity? By which you mean, where's the, where's the uplifting of the spirit? And so I, I, I'm just messing with you guys. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it, it's a good panel. I got a lot of value out of it. Um, we're, we're toying with the definition of content at MasterCard as something people will spend time or their money on. Um, do you guys think that that's a good definition of content? Um, that's not how I would define it. Um, content to me can be anything from um, the written word to a picture 
to. I'm saying advertising content, the like marketing content. Uh, same, same. The content is is. I don't think there's a time that you give it or amount of time you give content. It's more, it's anything that that touches a customer. It's anything the customer sees as content. Okay. I I I, I kind of like these metrics as. Uh, um, you know, if you're going to put numbers to the value of something like content, and again, coming back to the thought I had earlier about treating it like a product, right? if people are actually willing to pay for it, you know, that's, that's a pretty good indicator that it's valuable to them. Um, you know, we, we have not sold much of our marketing content. Uh, but time spent is another one, right? People's time is increasingly valuable, and their, their mind share is split in so many different directions that if you're actually able to get a meaningful amount of time from somebody, uh, that, that's, that's a pretty good indicator of success for my Yeah, perspective. and that's what we're thinking. I mean, if you take this idea, like everyone went overboard with all these platforms and creating all this content, brands as publishers, we have 6,000 articles, what are the best conch fritters in the Bahamas? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's great, it could be priceless, but what if we really focused on, on some of the great things that, uh, are truly priceless, and then take all that money that would have gone to creating this this halo effect of content, and just shift to like three or four big things. I think that's a, a direction we're, we're thinking about. And back, back to the com question I got earlier about line shape space. That is one of the measures that we use. How much time did people spend reading different articles? Right. Right. And and it's it's one of the key measures of of success on that blog. Good. Thank you. The question I would have that. I guess picks up on elements of that is, you know, what does this do for cause marketing? Because I guess there used to be a sense in which you said, well, you know, we can't really talk a lot about the product, so let's just attach ourselves to some cause and we'll, get, we'll engage people that way. Does this personalization help you to do better cause marketing or does it make it sort of redundant in, in a world where you can just engage directly around the value of the product itself in a better way? I don't know. I wish you so when you talk about cause marketing, you're talking about... Um, Embracing a charity, a charity or, yeah. or something of like that kind. Of. So what I've seen um, done very successfully with that is when you um, are leveraging your expertise to help um, someone do good. So what I mean by that is um, a great example is, uh, you know, Dell um, is in the, uh, you know, server farm, you know, data, data uh, business. And they leveraged and told stories about how the technology was used to research pediatric cancer, for example. Um, you can tell great content, great stories on the future of cancer research, leveraging technology. And those type of things that you can do in digital um, and tell in a very compelling way through digital mediums, um, I think are most effective where you tie your expertise so you can tell a differentiated story with helping a major cause move forward. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we are very engaged and we have an HSN Cares division of HSN and we have um, a lot of philanthropic activity that we do through that. And, you know, I, I would say that we use cause marketing in a way to connect with our customer. And we support charities that we know that are important to her. Uh, we let her voice herself to let us know what charities are important to her. We're currently under a campaign where we give $1,000 a, a day away to any charity that um, gets proposed by our customers. They submit their favorite charities and we figure out which ones um, we're gonna give $1,000 a day away to. Um, it's just another way of applying, going back, going back to the humanity aspect of this whole panel, is you know, it provides that emotional connection um, that um, is not necessarily about the brand itself, it's that as a brand, HSN, and as the customer, we're connecting on a common ground, which is that charity, so. The only thing I would add is that I think people are really good at smelling in, inauthenticity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if, if it appears that a, a company or a brand is trying to associate themselves with something, you know, in a manipulative way, mm -hmm. it's icky, you know, and it has the opposite effect. You know, I, you know in Autodesk, I think we, um, we, we had more of a generalist approach to supporting charities in, in the past, and, and we decided somewhat recently that r really, you know, to make it authentic, we, we should be supporting those that are closer to the kind of business that we do and, and that our customers do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, we do look for 
supporting charities or um, you know nonprofits that that are in the design world and are trying to solve a particular uh, problem for humanity using design or benefit from our tools to do so. And, and I think that's I think that's helped. So just we're almost out of time, but just to pick up on. I guess this authenticity theme. I mean, uh, there's a lot of thinking that the, the nature of a brand in future is increasingly as a vehicle for a two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that you're finding most helpful in terms of hearing from your customer and the, the, what's working best in terms of feedback uh, for each of you? Is there one example you could tell us as we wrap up? We, from an HSM perspective, we have it anywhere from the reviews that our customers leave on the website to our community forum. We have a community forum that um, our customers engage with one another on. Um, we have an arcade. We have a retail arcade that they can go into and um, leave comments and you know, talk to one another. Um, we, our customers engage with each other quite a bit. Um, What's the newest thing that's really emerged? What's the, the newest thing? Yeah, the thing that... Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's new. I think that it's just the fact that they've become so much more comfortable with social. So whether it being more on Facebook, on Twitter, they're more, our customers getting more comfortable with sharing that information and sharing herself with, with us and with um, the other people within the HSN community. Um, but we also have testimonials. I mean, we have people that call in every day and talk about how much they love the product or love the host or love the celebrity or whoever it may be or the designer. So um, it's constant feedback is, we're always having conversations with our customer. Definitely knew that you're finding effective in that area. Yeah, we, we try lots of different things and there's, there's, we're always seeing you know, new, new ways of potentially collecting feedback from people. But I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, don't, I can't think of one that, that is better than actually talking with the customer, mm -hmm. right? So d digital allows you to scale things, but it does not allow you to go deep enough, in my experience, to really understand the dynamics and create you know, insights that, to do something like reshape a product or something. Rishi, last word to you. I have a great example. So I agree. You know, a lot of our customers are extremely digital. So we do hear a lot in the social space, a lot digitally, but nothing beats that conversation with that inside sales rep or outside sales rep. I'll give a great example in our small business space, the small and medium business space. You know, we have one service that we provide to small businesses that is of such value to them. It makes them so happy. They literally have sent us in additional money because they felt like we were undercharging for that product because, and they were afraid that that product would go away because we wouldn't make enough money off of it. So, um, you know, that, that is... Uh, this can't it, possibly be true. It is totally true, and this is it. But these are small businesses, you know, because we work with the biggest global enterprises in the world, but we also work with family-owned businesses where some of the stuff that they leverage us for is their lifeblood. And so um, hearing that directly from our sales reps, them calling up our, you know, their contact at our company and human-to-human, and -human, you know, interaction, um, nothing beats that kind of feedback. And that drives a lot of our decisions even though we're all over digital. <laughs> so if people pay you afterwards, you'll tell us what that service is. is that right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's our concierge service for small business. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, well, thank you very much to the panel. Our time is up. Um, it's been a really stimulating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you.